Why the hell did you paint it titty pink? So when I was a kid, I had always wanted a cool car and I couldn't afford a cool car. And, you know, my mom buying me one was out of the question. So uh, I figured, well, I'm either going to have to save up money or I'm going to have to build one. And a friend of mine in high school, his name was Dallin, had a 1969 Camaro SS big block car that his brothers had bought as a project and they had finished it. And he brought it to school one day and it was a, they had swapped out the 396 for a 454. It was painted uh, this Kelly green color and a big hockey stripe down the side, four speed. And it was the most gorgeous thing I'd ever seen in my life. It's a 16 year old boy. And he let me drive it, which was even cooler. And he let me, I said, hey man, can you mind if I, you know, give it a little bit of the business? And he said, sure. And I said, can I spin the tires a little bit? And he goes, yeah, yeah, sure. And I had never done a burnout before. I thought, ah, what the heck? Can't be that hard, right? Just mash the pedal, pop the clutch, you're fine. So without any drama or wheel spin, I was told that I was burning the clutch and I was not allowed to drive anymore. Okay, fair enough. May, a couple of years later, I had lost it after this green Camaro and I had uh, come into knowledge about a car across the country. I was 18 years old. This is pre-Craigslist, pre-forums, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And I found a white 69 Camaro in Maryland. And I sent the guy the money and they was gonna send it on this truck, deliver it to my house. And I'm 18, I, don't, I didn't know how any of this worked. And they never they didn't come, they didn't come, they didn't come. And so about a week later, I called up the, called up the guy, I said, what happened to the to tow service? They were supposed to come get it. And he goes, I, I don't know what happens, but the sheriff's going to tow it. So you better come get it. You've already paid for it. Well, I'm 900,000, whatever miles away. I can't come get it. So I end up calling the sheriff of his county and said, hey, there's a white 69 Camaro sitting on the street. Would you mind not towing it for a couple days? He goes, I have no idea what you're talking about. Now I'm wondering if the car is actually real. And so I call the guy back and he says, no, no, it's real. It's just sitting at the end of my driveway. Oh, okay. So I finally get it back to the house. It has a 400 small block in it. And it's not an original Z car, even though it's got all the badges to look like a Z car. It's not an original Z28. I thought I was the coolest kid on the street. I had a 69 Camaro with white with black stripes down the middle of it. And it was just cool. And driving around with it and uh, just being stupid, doing power slides and, you know, doing, just spinning around and just figuring out how that works. And a friend of mine goes, uh, you know, the right exhaust, there's a lot of blue smoke coming out of that. And I'm like, oh, whatever, it's just cold, you know, it's vapor, it's fine, no big deal. Sure enough, the motor was crap. It had bent several valves and uh, that's why it was running poorly. And I just thought it had a big cam, I'm 18. I didn't know the difference between big cam and bent valves. So I had to rebuild this motor. While I'm 18, I spent all the money on the car. I'm, I'm broke, I have no money. So I call my grandfather and I had been regaled of stories for many years by my uncle and my grandfather about my uncle's 69 original Z, it was yellow with black stripes, about how he used to race up and down. He was the fastest thing in the street, of course, right? Always the fastest thing, stoplight to stoplight, you know, could never, could never, could never be beat. And my, my grandfather had said, uh, yeah, he was pretty fast. And my grandfather worked for the fire department at the time. And uh, my uncle being pulled over a number of times for street racing back in the early 70s would always get told because the fire marshals and the police were very close. They'd always go up to him and say, Andy, did you know Rick was racing tonight? And uh, my grandfather would give him the stern, mm-hmm, but did he win? And uh, that's kind of how it went. And uh, they told me that the, my uncle had blown up the transmission a number of times and my, by, by now my grandfather could replace it and rebuild it uh, blindfold. He had blown it up so many times. So I called the only Camaro person I know, and that's my grandfather, and uh, he had been kind of putting money away from me in a bank account since I was like five years old. 
It wasn't a lot. It was like eight, nine hundred bucks. And I said, um, do you mind if I have that? I would like to use that money to um, rebuild the engine in my car. I had never rebuilt an engine in my life, let alone taken one out. I had no idea what I was doing. None. And I had a, a simple set of Craftsman hand tools, uh, ratchets, and uh, wrenches that he had given me the previous Christmas, and that was kind of the extent of my tools. But I was bound and determined to do this. And uh, there's a photo of the Camaro at a 45 degree angle in my garage with uh, two by fours underneath, which how I survived and lived through taking an engine out of that process, I have no idea. But here I am. And he says, sure, I don't mind sending you that money. It was meant for your college or whatever, but you're already in college, so, you know, not that, not that big a deal. And, you know, cars have been kind of your thing for a couple of years now, so it helps keep you off the streets and, you know, getting out, you know, with the gangs and the bad people. And I thought that was an odd comment because not a lot of gangs in suburban Minnesota. He sent me the money and I, I, I ended up pulling the motor. He, one day, says, calls me up and says, Eric, when, when is the motor coming back from the machine shop? I said, uh, Thursday. He said, okay. I get the motor back to my house on the engine stand, and what I thought was a cranberry red color I was going to paint the engine, I have no idea why I thought this was a good idea. I should have gone with orange, Chevy orange, hugger orange, any, you know, traditional Chevy colors. I decided to go with cranberry red. Don't ask me why. He decides he's going to drive all the way from Springfield, Missouri, all the way up to Minnesota to help me rebuild this. Cool. All right. I got, you know, I got some hands-on experience. So I have the block painted, and there it is. He looks at this and goes, in his southern charm, of course, says, why the hell did you paint it titty pink? I said, well, it's cranberry red. Looks titty pink to me. Thanks, Grandpa. We rebuild the motor and put it back together. And he leaves, and uh, it, was a, it was a bummer because he didn't get to hear the first start, but it did start up within the first two or three tries, which was really cool, uh, being my first attempt at rebuilding a motor. So I called him and started up for him and over the phone, and he just, you know, he was, that was the coolest thing ever. And he was the, one of those guys that you could tell him uh, any mechanical problem over the phone, and he could tell you exactly how to fix it. He was not a traditionally classically educated person. He was a school of hard knocks kind of guy who learned on the job. And sometimes those are the best people to know because they know the wrong way to do things because they've done it. And he taught me a lot of life lessons that way. And he would say, that's not how I would do it, but he let me screw up anyway and make me look stupid. And he goes, well, you'll figure it out. And I still remember when he passed away, I went to his funeral and I gave a speech, and um, the church that he was at had a 400-person capacity. And it was standing room only at this church. There was a number of people out into the hallway. There was way over 400 people at this place. I mean, it was, I, I never, I didn't quite grasp the magnitude of impact that he had had on a number of people. He was not always the most pleasant person to get along with, but he was by far the most level-headed, useful person you would ever find. And apparently what I was told was uh, he was a very hard-nosed individual until the first grandson was born. And he mellowed out, which was me. And when he passed away, when he, uh, all the, the gentlemen from the firehouse, he was a, he was a fireman for uh, close to three decades. And uh, so all the firemen that I had recognized from growing, you know, going to the farm, uh, firehouse so many years, I had, uh, you know, I, these faces started coming back to me. And one guy came to me and he says, you still have that old Camaro? I said, uh, no, I, no I, I sold that one a while ago. And he goes, you couldn't get Andy to shut up about that. As soon as you, f you fired that thing up on the phone for him, he would not stop talking about that. And I still remember that as one of the most kind of poignant moments in your life when you think back, because you think your parents or your grandparents or whoever, they got their own lives, they got their own thing, you know, 
it, they don't really think much of you, you know, because he was 800, 600, 7, whatever, 100 miles away. You don't really think much. He doesn't, you don't think that you enter their thoughts very often. But I still remember one of those guys come up to me and says, you know, he was really proud of you for that. That was a big deal. He never brags about anything, but he was pretty proud about that. We'd like to thank Vincero Watches for supporting VinWiki this month. Vincero makes bold, stylish, and well-priced watches out of exceptional materials, and there's a link in the description below for a discount. So check out their website and find the watch that helps make the statement that you want the world to see.